Hello, I'm Bridget Ayer with All About the Grace. Good to be with you again. And my guest today is James Bopp Jr. He is an attorney at law at the Bopp Law Firm, right? And yes, Bridget, great. And, and you, you specialize in constitutional law. And the topic that we're going to be talking about today is religious freedom. And in Indiana, a while back, we had an issue with the religious Freedom Restoration Act, which is also called RIFRA. Um, what is religious freedom exactly? Because I think there's a lot of confusion about what that is. It's not freedom to worship in your private space. What is the freedom of religion and why do we have it in this country? Oh, there are two principal reasons why our country was founded, two principles that were our country was founded upon. One was religious freedom. And the second was uh, self-government, uh, that we would govern ourselves, which meant that we would have a lot of freedom to make our own decisions about our own lives. Uh, but then, to a limited extent, we were, of course, going to have government uh, that would have specific powers, uh, that, but we would choose uh, who our leaders were. It wouldn't be like in, in England, you know, the royalty uh, that decided uh, what the laws were, but it would be democratic self-government uh, is how we would select our, our uh, leaders. Well, religious freedom uh, meant um, not just belief, uh, it also meant practice, religious practice, so that a person's beliefs can be carried out in their everyday lives. So, uh, and, and of course, most believers that's inherent in their faith. Uh, faith isn't just something we think about. Uh, it's something that we act on, that we practice in our everyday lives. It's a, it's a, a way, we, uh, way we conduct ourselves. Uh, and uh, so, uh, so we have in the First Amendment, because the First Amendment is protecting the two most important principles, democratic self-government and free exercise religion. So we have two concepts in the First Amendment. Now, one is is that, uh, that we would not establish a religion okay. uh, at the course time, and, and including today in, in a number of countries. We have an official church that is a government-sanctioned church, and that everybody in the country is obligated under penalty of being thrown in jail, tortured, or murdered uh, by the state. Uh, if you're not a member of that church. And that's uh, kind of, so we said, no established churches. Okay. And that's kind of how it is in maybe some Muslim countries, and that's how it was in England before our country was founded. And that's what the United States was founded in part, is to just to be free to practice the faith, whatever faith it is, without the government telling you or suppressing you or forcing you to do or not do certain things, right? That's right. Not, uh, yeah, the, the uh, free exercise of religion, which is the other part, mm -hmm. uh, 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 is uh, guaranteeing and protecting uh, your ability to practice your religion and that the government cannot uh, impinge upon that unless it's to uh, advance a, a what's called a compelling governmental interest, you know, really important reason. You know, examples have been historically uh, animal sacrifice. I mean, we haven't had in America any religions that practice human sacrifice, even though there certainly are, have been historically, you know, a whole bunch of them, including in Central America and South America, that practice human sacrifice. But since the founding of our country, no, no religion would practice human sacrifice, but some would practice animal sacrifice. And that was considered a compelling governmental interest to stop that. And so it is really extremely rare for the government to have the authority under the First Amendment to say, well, you can't practice your particular religion. Uh, so, those, so that was, you know, a critically important, not only... Uh, in terms of respecting the sanctity and dignity of each individual person, and if you believe in that, which, which Christians and Catholics certainly do, uh, believe in the sanctity of the individual, part of that sanctity of the individual is the ability to choose you know, your own religion. 
So mm -hmm. that's that's showing respect for the the individual person. So we welcome all religions, and you know, uh, and uh, not only is that wonderful as a matter of principle and respect for people, but it's also prevent has prevented enormous strife uh, because you know if if the decision on who the next president is going to be will also choose what religion you can practice. Oh yeah. And so religious wars, <laughs> the religious wars in England between the Catholics and the Protestants. You know, after uh, you know the English kings decided that they wanted to do some divorce, and uh, you know, threw out the Catholic Church and started a new church. Well, Catholics were then persecuted uh, because they weren't members of the Church and uh, the Church of England, and then they uh, they literally met Church of England, the government of England. And then, of course, there was, uh, you know, then civil war uh, between uh, the Catholics and the Protestants over who would who would run the government because it became really a, a big deal, and uh, we've avoided all that in America. And I hope I hope we don't ever go down that path again. But <laughs> sometimes in recent in recent days, you know, history has a way of repeating itself, and it seems. You know, just in the past, maybe even 10 years, it just seems like, you know, to be um, a Catholic or to be a Christian or to have certain beliefs and to either act on those in the public square or to even maybe talk about those in the public square, you know, you might be put out of business. Um, now, we can, talk, we can talk about that, but let's go back to what was, what is the religious... Uh, what is RIFRA? What's the Religious Restoration Freedom Act? What is that? Um, what has that been historically? And then what in the heck happened in Indiana that caused such a big problem? Well, uh, there was a Supreme Court decision in, uh, uh, in the uh, early 90s that said that, uh, not th is that certain government actions would be exempt from uh, the protection of free exercise of religion, and that, and that uh, go certain governmental laws that weren't specifically targeting a certain religious practice, mm -hmm. that were general, okay? For instance, our drug control laws, all right? That there are there's a federal drug control law that defines certain drugs as being prohibited from being used, mm -hmm. right? Well, one of those drugs is peyote. Okay. Uh, and it was a hallucinogen. And as it turns out, there was a American Indian tribe uh, in Oregon that used uh, peyote in, in their religious services. So they sued and said, well, look, this general law that is not targeting our religion, but is, is prohibiting the use of a, of a drug that we would otherwise use in our religious practices. Okay. in our ceremonies, uh, that that violated our free exercise of religion. Uh, well, the Supreme Court held that if the law is generally applicable and not targeting a specific religious practice, well then, free exercise of religion didn't apply and they said the American Indians couldn't use the drug. Mm. So, in their, in their religious services. And there was no compelling governmental interest to do this. This was not you know, killing people or causing people, you know, to do things that were harmful to others or whatever. Uh, it was a historical part of the religion uh, going back centuries. So, uh, so people looked at that and said, well, wait a second, we can't have a generally, even though it's a generally applicable law, it may impinge upon somebody's religious freedom, mm -hmm. and therefore we uh, a person should be able to protect their religious freedom, uh, even though the law is generally applicable and not targeted toward them. And so that was what the Religious Freedom Restoration Act was all about. It was a federal law to restore this high level of protection called strict scrutiny uh, when you have a generally applicable law, if it impinges upon a religious practice. It was supported widely. I was one of the three authors of the of the federal RIFRA. I testified in Congress in favor of it, and it was supported, introduced by Teddy Kennedy. I mean, it was widely supported by the left and the right to restore this broad 
uh, religious freedom protection. Regardless of what law is impinging on your religious exercise, you should be able to say, well, wait, wait a second, the government can't do that unless they have a really important, you know, compelling governmental interest. So that passed Congress overwhelmingly. So this is, I mean, obviously this law protects every person's type of faith. It's, it's for anyone that has a religious faith, right? It's not just for Christians or for Muslims or Jewish people, although those are the main religions. It, it protects every person that practices a particular faith. Is that true? That's right. Religious freedom, That's right? right. Um, so well, let me give you an example. Okay, I gave ahead. you the example that was the case. Okay. But let's say that a city decided that uh, they, they didn't want specialized restaurants. And, okay. and they didn't want restaurants that only serve kosher. Okay. Or restaurants like Muslim restaurants that refuse to serve pork. Okay. That they, that they wanted everyone to be able to go into any restaurant and get whatever food they want. Let's say they decided they wanted to do that, okay? Well, that generally applicable law before the Religious Freedom Restoration Act would not have been protecting Orthodox Jews, would not have been protecting Muslims in how they wanted to practice their religion in terms of the food that they wanted to uh, cook, cook and serve. Mm -hmm. And uh, so they would be forced uh, into this. Uh, however, RIFRA meant, means that they can say, no, 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 uh, it doesn't matter if it's generally applicable, it, it, it impinges on my religious faith and, and my religious practice, and, and I can challenge that law. Okay, so let's go to Indiana. What was the Indiana, why, why did state lawmakers want to, what was the need for the Indiana RIFRA if you have a federal law, why can't it work in the state? Why, why did it come about? Because the, Go ahead. Because another Supreme Court decision held that the federal RIFRA only applied to federal law, okay. not to state laws. Okay. So, so if we wanted to apply the same principle, mm -hmm. that, that even generally applicable laws you can challenge mm -hmm. based upon a compelling, you know, requiring a compelling governmental interest, well, then you need to pass a state law. So over 20 states have done that. Mm -hmm. and, uh, several more recently have done that. And it was proposed in Indiana that we do that. That, that state laws, uh, even generally applicable state laws, ought to be ought to give way uh, uh, when a person has a religious practice that, it, that that would violate unless there's a compelling governmental interest to do a really, really important interest to do that. And uh, so that's why it was needed in Indiana. So what, what happened, it, Indiana got a lot of uh, a national attention and, and quite a bit of action, actually quite a bit of pushback um, on the bill, on the legislation to protect religious freedom. Um, what happened? Well, because it was distorted. It, it was, it was the, the, the purpose and meaning of the RIFRA was completely distorted. I mean, anybody that would have read the Indianapolis Star or, or looked at the mainstream media would have thought RIFRA was a law specifically targeting gays and lesbians, you know, to prohibit them from having the same rights as everybody else uh, if it violated somebody's religious, you know, tenets or whatever. And they, they, so they called it an anti-gay law. It was not an anti-gay law. It had really no origin in any thought about gay rights or any any of that. It was all about whether or not everyone's religion, religious practices should be protected from government suppression and intervention and violation uh, unless there's a really important interest that the government is advancing to do that. And so, but uh, now, uh, of course, that's the way they characterize RIFRA mm -hmm. and, and in fact in any case, it didn't even use a name, just said anti-gay, you know, law. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, and there were what, threats, you know, to uh, conventions wouldn't come here, whatever businesses wouldn't come here. And, uh, and so the, uh, that enormous pressure, the politicians gave way uh, to the fix. Yeah, so the, and the, of course, the fix yeah, the fix is a big problem. Okay, so tell me, 
what what was what did the religious the rifra fix do they changed the language to kind of water down the law but in doing so they created another problem right all right what so, they did was they they adopted an exclusion in other words everybody's religious practices were going to be held to this high standard of protection called strict scrutiny under RIFRA. They, did, they made an exclusion. The exclusion if, is if your religious practice uh, is based, uh, it has anything to do with sexual orientation or gender identity. If it has anything to do with sexual orientation or gender identity, you don't get this high level of protection and those religious beliefs can be trampled upon. Now, that, that comes into play when, uh, that was my next for instance, a church, well, a church uh, uh, believes in traditional marriage and would not uh, countenance having uh, a same-sex marriage uh, performed at their church, or a priest, uh, you know, uh, believes in traditional marriage would not perform a ceremony, or a Christian photographer uh, would want, not want to uh, use their talents to uh, photograph a, a same-sex marriage. It has nothing to do with, with whether or not somebody can have a same-sex marriage, mm -hmm. okay? It has everything to do with whether or not you can force or Shanghai people who have a religious tenet that pre prevents them from participating into what you're doing, all right? And, of course, what this all goes back to is, are we going to have tolerance, diversity, inclusion? Are we going to recognize and protect everybody's religious beliefs? Or are we going to have a state-imposed set of religious beliefs that you've got to follow? And, unfortunately, what we see from the left now is that's exactly what's happening. They, they, they don't care about the religious beliefs of other people. They, they, uh, what they are insisting upon and enlisting government to attack people is to attack people of faith when they just simply don't want to participate. Right. So, I mean, it, so let, let me live my own life. Right. Right? Right. You live your life. I'm doing nothing to prevent, to you know, I'm not sicking the government on you in terms of your practices or concern and your uh, uh, same-sex marriage, but you let me live my life. Now, that's the whole principle of religious freedom, mm -hmm. is that we have different views on different subjects, and the way, and the way to pr A, respect individuals and their, and their sanctity, and secondly, to have civil peace is to respect people's religious beliefs and practices and let them live their own life. But the left won't let that happen. 